Welcome to Me and Age Daydream with me, Brian McWilliams, where we're going to be making some jokes, laughing out at broken world, but also laying out the philosophy for the future, how we can fix this mess we're in and have a great time doing it all with the Me and Age Daydream. Welcome, everybody, to Mean Age Daydream. I am Brian McWilliams, as always, your beautiful, bald host. On a day when there's a lot of news, um, there is a lot of stuff I tweeted out at Brian McWilliams and, of course, retweeted at Lions of Liberty. Make sure to follow those. That I actually have some insight. Uh, now, this has been reported. I'm not the only one that's going to talk with this, but I'm the only one that you know that actually has a family member that has intimate knowledge of how the harbor industry works, how this boat that crashed into this major cargo ship that crashed into the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, actually how this could have happened. Um, I also want to talk about, before I get to that, I'll tell you what else I'm going to talk about. RFK Jr. just announced his pick for uh, vice president. <laughs> I'll tell you this. Actually, I'll, I'll wait because I want to say something specific about it and I don't want to curse too early in the episode or else I get dinged on YouTube. Uh, but I want to talk about that. I'll talk about the Royal Canadian Mounted Police scare, uh, scaremongering and fearmongering up there in uh, Kenyatta. And I also want to talk about the very popular show, The Three Body Problem, uh, which is on, I believe it's on Netflix. Yes, it is on Netflix and is a book that I had read, a series of books that I've read. What's interesting there is uh, the combination they've got of the DEI casting combined with some messaging. And uh, you can't get around it in the book about the communists and the way in which they went about a cultural purge. But before we do that, let's talk about this Baltimore accident. So essentially what has happened here, you saw probably everybody out there has seen the video by now. Major cargo ship is going down the river. It seems to just inexplicably go straight on for this pylon that is holding up, you know, a major portion of the bridge. And after it hits the bridge, essentially the bridge collapses from front to back. The entire thing collapses into the water. There was a construction crew that happened to be on the bridge at the time that did block traffic off. Uh, TBD, whether they had blocked traffic in advance of people coming if they knew this bridge because the reports coming in were that the people on the boat lost power and this is what i'll talk to you because it's been essentially confirmed i keep saying essentially for some reason it's been confirmed by my family member who works in the port system but that these construction workers there's some debate whether or not they are blocking traffic on the on the bridge intentionally because they know the bridge could collapse or if they just didn't get the notification in time to leave the bridge. But regardless, I'll tell you a little bit where I got my insight from. So a family member of mine works within the port system as a pilot. Now, what you call the people that take the boats down the river or into these harbors are pilots. They're very specialized people that know the ebbs and flows of the waterways. The one that I know, and I'm not going to say his name because he actually could get brought in to, uh, to testify on this matter when it gets around to the court systems. But Basically, what they do is they'll bring it in the massive cargo ships. They know the way the water's coming in. They know where the depth is. They know where the hazards are. And they're very specifically paid to bring these ships in, right? These are the best of the best when it comes to that uh, profession. So it's bizarre to see something like this happen. It wouldn't just happen out of the usual. It wouldn't just happen that somebody looked away and, and whoopsie doopsie, I dropped my coffee, you know, or fell asleep at the wheel. It's not that type of setup. So what he had said uh, basically is the only way that this could happen is that the power goes out on the boat. That then kills the water going over the propellers in the back, right? And then he says, if that happens, you're done. There's not much you can do. You can't control the boat. You're basically adrift. Now, people are pointing to in the video how this cargo ship seems to lose power then you see the backup generator, the diesels come on, right? There's big plumes of smoke that come up. And then you see it try to make an adjustment and it crashes in. Yeah, that's probably what happened, guys. And people are somehow arguing, let me nip this in the bud. I am as big a believer in conspiracy theories as probably anybody else out there. It's hard not to be, considering what we've seen over the past few years. But 
I'm sorry, I don't buy that this is the black swan event people are talking about. Number one, it's not that big of an event. Um, there's no, I don't think there's going to be any argument that cyber hackers came in and that was their target to take out this bridge because frankly, far too much is left to chance for this to have been some sort of cyber attack to take out their, their engine systems. No, no. This is going to cause problems in the shipping industry for sure. But guess what? Baltimore is a port along a eastern seaboard where there's a lot of other ports. Okay. It's not like this is going to isolate or cause any sort of uh, instance like what happened, you know, before and with the strait that was closed down. This is simply something that is probably a breakdown in a shipping industry that's behind. Uh, friends of mine I was just talking to recently, which is kind of interesting how this happened as well, into how the shipping industry and these big container ships are older. They're, they weren't replaced. COVID really impacted how these ships were being rolled out because the shipping industry had come to a halt, right? You had nowhere to put ships. You had nowhere to build ships because they weren't leaving. They weren't going out to ship these, you know, these, these massive cargo containers and you had cargo container ships sitting just docked out in the water for months and months and months because of COVID protocols, because of a loss of dock workers and people that bring them in that were either not allowed to come to work or had been forced into retirement early because they didn't want to take a jab. So you now have a shipping industry where a lot of these boats are aging out. They're not trustworthy. They're not seaworthy anymore. And you have a crisis where you don't have enough ships to replace them. And maybe, a, maybe from an industry perspective, they thought that the industry was slowing down in general. Maybe there wasn't an emphasis on creating new boats, but you're having this problem. So this to me seems like, and this is echoed by uh, my, my expert family member here, a mechanical failure. It's that simple. It's plain and simple. They lost power. They were not able to get the backup generators on time to, in order to change the trajectory of the boat. And like I was saying, to presume that this is some sort of intentional glide into the pylon is stupid. If you watch the video, you can see the boat is adrift, tries to correct course, and the way that it just happened to have come into this pylon took out the bridge. That's where we're at. It's a tragedy. It's horrible. But... These things happen, guys. I mean, not everything is a conspiracy. Not everything means that uh, that this is the powers that be distracting us from P. Diddley having sex with minors in his mansion. Sometimes crazy things happen. And when you have circumstances like this, an old boat and frankly, a bridge, which doubtless has not been kept up to the standards that we would, we would like, that probably does not have... Um, you know, repairs done on it as regularly as might be needed to make sure that if something like this did happen, that the bridge wouldn't collapse on itself. Well, this is the result. So I know it's fun <laughs> to talk about conspiracies, but in this case, it's a, a bridge too far. Excuse the, the terrible pun. Okay. So that being addressed, um, we'll see. We'll see those. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of lawsuits. I'm, I'm going to be fascinated to see what Pete Booty Judge can do with his erector set, see if he can get that bridge put up uh, quickly in Baltimore. But obviously, it's uh, a horrible circumstance for the people involved, for the people that fell in the water. And I don't want to make too light of that, uh, at least not yet. I'm not uh, that much of a, of a bastard. So let's move on and talk about RFK Jr. So RFK Jr., obviously flirted with the Libertarian Party. Of course, as you all know, I am involved with the Libertarian Party as communications director. So a lot of inquiries have come in our way, uh, conversations between me and, and our chair about, well, what do we want to say about this RFK situation? Because he did, uh, in fact, flirt with the Libertarian Party. He did, in fact, talk about, and look, he may yet. I'm not going to tell you that he's not for sure going to come over, but I'll say this. His VP pick, number one, goes against the libertarian standard, which is we vote on a vice presidential candidate. So if, if RFK Jr. is set on having his person as his VP, which has been announced as the most fart noises of fart noise candidates you could ever announce, Nicole Shanahan, who is a former wife of uh, Sergey Brin, co-founder of Google, she's just a girl with a lot of money. And she actually is the one that funded what I liked. I thought it was a great commercial the RFK Jr. Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy update ad that ran during the Super Bowl. Her Super PAC paid for that. At the time, RFK Jr. said, 
I didn't even know about this. Ah, because people, his family members that hate him were pissed off that he would dare, or a super PAC would dare use the Kennedy image and these old campaign videos to promote his campaign currently. So considering that she's his VP pick, that certainly pokes a hole in that, doesn't it? That uh, somehow, oh, this, this woman that he was so upset that they used this footage, oh, well, I'm going to bring her in as my VP. Great job. If you talk about one way you could undercut a campaign that had momentum, it is by picking somebody that is essentially left-wing, old money, uh, deeply involved within the entire global elite power structure like a Nicole Shanahan. And as mentioned, there's now essentially no way he can become the Libertarian uh, candidate, even if we would want him to be. Um, and I say we as in the grander libertarian voters, even if we should want him to be the candidate, if he wants to have his VP in there, then he's basically forcing us now to say, we have to vote for her. Like we have to vote for her. Or if, if he wants to cause a big stink and say, I refuse. Now it might be a Gary Johnson, Bill Weld thing where he stumps for her and gets her in there, but she's probably one of the more repugnant ones. RFK Jr. has got his own views, which don't jive with a lot of our perspective as far as Israel goes, as far as some of his climate concerns go, as far as who might put in like a Supreme Court pick. Those might not jive in general. But there was a trade-off there in that you're gaining the notoriety, you're gaining a voter percentile, which might be higher than we could achieve without a candidate like an RFK Jr. in theory, who can galvanize people uh, to his side that are discontented with Biden and Trump and know his name. They know his body of work. He's not coming out of nowhere, as many libertarian candidates tend to do as far as their knowledge within the broader population. But the trade-off to that is, of course, the things that we don't agree with him on. And he's evolved on a lot of those. But with this pick, like I said, he's basically shat the bed. He he could have picked, I mean, Aaron Rodgers would have been better. There's no way Aaron Rodgers was going to do it, but he could have picked somebody that has some sort of inspirational factor other than I've got money, which is essentially all she brings to the table here. So I think, and I've seen this sentiment on Twitter as well. He, with this pick, has lost not just me, you know, let's say, and again, I was, was not going to vote for him over a libertarian candidate anyway, but he would have lost people that were more like me, you know, people that are, that were considering him as an alternative to a Donald Trump. He has now lost. Write him off. Uh, I don't think there's a stupider pick he could have made. I don't think there's a more saboteur. You know, if you had, if you had you know, snuck in an agent saboteur in his campaign, this was probably what they would have done. Now, the counter argument to that from a PR perspective is that, or, or I say a marketing perspective, she does have gobs of money. Maybe people that don't know her politics, that, that, are, that are not a, as, as well versed in what this pick could be or who she is, maybe they can simply buy their way into enough notoriety to still get 10, 12%. But I think now, the odds of him pulling any sort of quote unquote upset of which there was virtually zero chance anyway, have really been knocked down quite a bit. Now it's simply going to be, can we spend enough money to influence enough goobers that don't watch any news to vote for us? That I, I think is the only play they have left after the stupid pick. So anyway, giant fart noise. Good job. Um, yeah, just, Really fucking crappy. RFK. That's a crappy with a K. Really fucking crappy pick. <laughs> Just awful. Awful. Um, speaking of awful, now that we've gone through that, I want to talk about this little story here. And uh, I saw this a couple days ago, but it is a, <laughs> a fear-mongering tactic out of the Canadian Royal Mounted Police. And, you know, they, they call themselves the Canada Royal Mounted Police. They don't have as many horses as I'd like. They're not riding moose around as I had presumed that they would, which is a huge letdown. But these jerk-offs, uh, through an access to information request, right, released a secret report, quote-unquote, I put secret in giant quotes, because this is a document that was created to be leaked. 
So the out, the document outlines troubling trends to prepare for cat in Canada, including climate change, misinformation, government distrust, and a global recession. So quote, these are some quotes from the, uh, I'm pulling this from CTV news. These are some quotes from the document. The global community has experienced a series of crises with COVID-19, supply chain issues, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine sending shockwaves throughout the world. The situation will probably deteriorate further in the next five years as the early effects of climate change and a global recession add their weight to the ongoing crises. <laughs> the early effects of climate change, guys, of which the early effects of climate change, do you know what they've been? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But that's, that's what's really going to scare us, right? Because remember, we've got a war between Russia and Ukraine that's now three years old. And by the way, markets have adjusted. Um, the only thing that's going to come out of this is there's going to be a ceasefire pretty soon, I, I assure you, because Joe Biden doesn't want to have this support for the Ukraine war, which is becoming even more unpopular by the day, by the minute, especially as these jerk-offs send more money over to Ukraine. He wants to clear that out before this comes to a head. Right. It, it only benefits him. Trump's going to campaign on how he would end this uh, this war. He would get a ceasefire. Right. Joe Biden knows this. So that and the markets have adjusted is going to actually lead to a greater boon. Right. The economy picking back up again, because now you've got Ukrainian grain going out there. Now you have Russian fuel open up and gas is now open up again for people to utilize. If anything, the opposite is going to happen. We're not going to enter a global recession because of these former crises. We're emerging out of a global recession caused by COVID lockdowns and by this horseshit war that has been kept going by American influence and, and economic backing. So the coming period of recession will also accelerate the decline in living standards that the younger generations have already witnessed compared to earlier generations. It goes on to state that many Canadians under 35 are unlikely to ever be able to buy a place to live ever. <laughs> I mean, the, the, listen to the fear mongering language. This now, remember this report is put together by the Canadian Royal Mounted Police. Why is the Canadian Royal Mountain Police doing economic analysis of what youngins under 35 will or will not be able to buy insofar as owning a home or a cardboard box in a Canadian alley in Ottawa? What? Really? If this is a secret document, and it's only nine pages long, by the way, <laughs> a secret nine page document. Why the fuck are they talking about these things to begin with? They're just sitting around they're like, you know what, guys, they're sitting around, you know, we're like, well, we don't have any horses anymore. We have nothing to do with all this horse grain. Let's make it into some mead. You know, let's make it into some, uh, some sort of shitty Canadian back alley cop beer and we'll hash out all the world's problems. We're going to put them in this secret document, right? But don't tell anybody. This is just for us. Everybody gets a copy to put in their locker and you can put one on your horse's ass. That's it. No one else allowed to see it. On to the document. The report also includes sections of erosion of trust and paranoid populism and effects of climate devastation. Again, because the Canadian Royal Mounted Police have all the information you will ever need about what's going to happen with our climate, the impact of climate change on our, uh, our Canadian neighbors up to the north, and how this is going to affect the younger population, right? And, and of course, the broader economic spectrum of global economics, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police. Quote, law enforcement should anticipate that these destructive weather patterns will impact and affect all facets of government, including damage to critical infrastructure, pressure to seed Arctic territory and more pressure to seed Arctic territory. Why are they <laughs> again? Is this <laughs> so I think the Canadian mounted police are telling us that they're going to be under pressure and they're going to be uh, told that from an international perspective, it's going to be so warm that Canada is going to have to give up its colder areas because otherwise, where will we get ice cubes from? Right? I think that's what I'm reading into this. I think it sounds about right. A section of the Arctic warns that Northern Canada will experience the effects of climate change sooner than the rest of the country. Oh, maybe it's the opposite. So they're saying that it's going to be raw materials are going to be exposed in the Arctic areas because of climate change and that the global bodies will want to get at them. And that's where the Royal Mounted Police, that's their concern. Okay, Royal Mounted Police. 
Uh, this is okay. So let me just, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but they, they said that the report, this nine page report that clearly is within the spectrum of what the mounted police would cover was written by the forces, federal policing street strategy management team in 2023. And it was a forecasting exercise based on a review of open source articles and reports. I will just say this report is horseshit. Everything that Canada has done in the past two years has amounted to a concerted effort to not only terrify the population, but to lock down on any dissent within the population. So any documents that are coming out, be they quote unquote FIOA Canada style reports or leaked or whatever they might be, I think are going down that exact same path. You look at what Canada does as far as the criminalization of hate speech, similar to what uh, Scotland's doing that just passed. It was psychotic, where they can go after you if you're a comedian that tells a joke that offends somebody. They can now arrest you. Canada's basically gone on the same pathway. You look at what's happened with the the uh, you know, truckers' convoys, where they shut their bank accounts down, uh, which was first deemed completely fine by Canadian courts, and then later they took a second look and went, you know, maybe not. Maybe you're not allowed to crush free speech and crush, crush public protests to uh, completely unconstitutional, by Canada standards, laws and uh, take their bank accounts away because they dared to oppose this authoritarianism. Well, Canada looks to be going even farther down the road. Now, I've seen some tweet tweets on you know public polling. I've seen some conservative Canadians say, look, there's a, an upwelling here of support against what's happening, against Trudeau's government, against the the left-wing authoritarians that have been dominating Canadian politics for the past few years. I don't know. We'll see. But shit like this goes to show you that the powers, and I guess, I don't know, would you call the Canadian Royal Mounted Police a deep state in Canada? I mean, they're definitely an institution. I guess they're, they're as close to a deep state Canadian style as you want to get. I think Canada's part of the five eyes as well, aren't they? I think they are, but it's just another drop in the bucket for control of the population, for manipulation of people's understanding, for fear mongering to get people to buy into why we need things like hate speech laws. Because even in this document, they're talking about how distrust, right? Misinformation. Oh, well, the, can you know, the police have to crack down on that. Okay. Well, they're talking about, this is a police document how this is a big problem for Canada. Okay, and it just happens to coincide with all the authoritarian censorship laws and uh, you know enabling people to be prosecuted for quote-unquote hate speech or ownership of hateful documents. Well, that all ties into this, right? It's basically the cops saying, well, we have to do this. We found, in our own research, we found that these are the problems, so we have to have these laws, don't you know? It's despicable. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you're seeing it on a global stage. And I did a, in the, the uh, Patreon or locals, which you guys can join if you want to support the show, my uh, daily rants. I talked about a former guest on the show, CJ Hopkins, who was, uh, is, is an author. He's currently in Germany and he wrote a book, which is, I think like, I can't remember the exact t- title of it, but it's like the new Reich. Right. And, and essentially what he talked about was that Germany had, undertaken Nazi style censorship and authoritarian measures and totalitarian measures in Germany during COVID and refused to back off on this. They criminalized free speech when it came to criticizing immigration, when it came to criticizing COVID measures. So he wrote a book on it and satirically put a Nazi symbol, very vague Nazi symbol on a mask about this overstep by the German government. And they took him to court. They tried to prosecute him. They tried to jail him. Now, he fortunately won this first case, but they're trying to do it again. They're trying to bring up again and and bring him back into court, even though the judge had said that she hated him (laughs) for his for his words, called him a, I don't know, like a shit mumbler in German, but said, but you're right, this oversteps the legal boundaries. But she hated the fact that he had the gall to step up and, and stand up to the government. So they're trying to drag him back into prison. But he had made a statement that this is not an anti-Trump thing when you talk about the censorship and the authoritarian of the, of the left, because this is a global move. 
This is a global movement from every world government, uh, you know, every leftist World Economic Forum government to crack down on free thought, on free speech, on critical thinking skills. It is a concerted effort to instill fear in the population. And you see it with Canada right now. You see it with Scotland. You see with Ireland, at least the Irish had the balls to, to stand up and say no to this. At least their prime minister was forced to resign. All right, let's move on to the three-body problem. We'll have to do a few more minutes on that because I do think it's pretty interesting. So the three-body problem, if you guys aren't familiar with this book, is a uh, fantastic set of novels by, God, what's this guy's name? Three-body problem. Does I know him? Uh, Liu, Liu Sisin. I probably fucked that up. I even speak Chinese <laughs> a little, and I can't, uh, I don't know, Wabudong. That means I don't know. So it's an odd Chinese name, C-I-N, anyway, X-I-N. So fascinating book where, it, and I don't want to give too many spoilers away if you want to read the book, if you want to watch the series, but it focuses on what would happen if we made contact with an alien race and if that alien race decided they're coming, right? And uh, it ends up with a pretty fascinating finish which brings in this whole concept of uh, the dark forest. I'll leave it at that. You can look into that yourself. As I said, I don't want to spoil the book for you, but there's a concept called the dark forest when it comes to interplanetary exploration that is a pretty interesting theory. I think it makes a lot of sense. It's kind of two theories on whether or not space exploration reaching out to other foreign species, should they be out there on a, you know, a galactic scale, is a good idea or not. So this book focuses on that. And the three body problem, the name of this is essentially that you go, they go into this game and there are three solar bodies and that is the three body problem they have to solve. It kind of introduces them to this whole, um, dialogue with the foreign race, but it takes place in at least part of the book takes place in communist China during the, uh, the revolution where they had the, you know, the red youth rising up. You had the cultural youth gangs that were inspired under Mao. Right. And they were purging their own people. The youth turned on their adult counterparts and you had these trials. You had these basically show trials, kind of like the old days of the inquisition where they would drag physicists. And they have a scene in the first episode where one of the young girls who becomes, she's one of the main characters, very intelligent, you know, girl working in the sciences. Her father's dragged up on stage by the revolutionary guard and they're, you know, berated and beaten and made to renounce this, this evil of, of Western thought that is science. And he refused to do so. And they beat him to death in front of everybody, beat him to death. And throughout this, it showcases, and this is in the book as well, showcases. And by the way, I was, I was fascinated reading this book. I remember texting a friend of mine, how I was so interested that this book was published in communist China and is so outwardly critical of what happened in prior eras. Maybe that maybe they figure, well, whatever, you know, cause the author's Chinese, maybe they figure, oh, well, that was, people are going to affiliate that with the old times. Now we're, we're far more advanced now with science and technology and all this other shit. But it is interesting because you wonder how much farther along China would be if they hadn't purged so many of their top scientists and thinkers and educators during the communist revolution that happened. But they, they make a point in the book and in the show that this is wrong ideology, right? That this ideology of puritanical observance of this is the new law. This is the new way of thinking. It is, you know, we are socialists. This is group think. And if you step outside, you're beaten and you're murdered in front of a, a cheering rabble of, of young dipshits. Like you saw marching through the, the communists of New York city when they took to the streets, right? dipshit rabble that have no understanding of history nor uh, how these things impact the outcome of their society. So it was fascinating to see the three body problem highlight this. But in the meantime, the book itself, the first book was written by a Chinese person and all the characters are ethnic Chinese with very few exceptions. Like maybe there's one or two in the book that I can think of that weren't ethnic Chinese. <laughs> so what do they do when they make this on Netflix? Well, of course, let me see. Actually, I'd, I'd read through. Let me see if I can bring it up here on my my share screen because somebody did a good job using uh, AI mid journey, which is like a graphic arts 
AI processor. Here we go. The characters. And I'll share my screen here for those of you that are watching along on Twitter or on YouTube or Rumble. Thank you for you live viewers. Good to have you here. So let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. No, no such luck. So they've got the people that are original, the originals, and they reinvented DEI-centric characters. So this is from a, uh, a, an account called at DDDAS. I'll give them credit, at D-E-E-D-Y-D-A-S. But here's the original characters, and here's what Netflix did with the DEI horse shit, a.k.a. Groupthink. That's the irony here. On the left, Wing Miao, right? He's the main character. On the right, Augie Salazar. So instead of a Asian man, it is now a Latino woman because God knows we can't have enough women in a, as stars of our shows. Every show now has to be gender swapped to have a female lead character. As Cartman said, make her female and make her gay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Put a lady in it, make her gay and make her lame. <laughs> so they're going down the line with that. And by the way, I will say, in the first few minutes of this show, it pissed me off. I, I had to force myself to continue to watch it. And so far, it's it's pretty good, I will say. I, I endorse you guys to watch it, at least so far, from the first three episodes. It's pretty good. The The DEI casting shit really pisses me off, and I'll, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But they go to a bar, this gal, Augie Salazar and uh, Jin Cheng, who is her uh, her little compatriot there, they go to a bar and a guy's hitting on him and he's like, I bet I can guess what you do. And of course they have the guy guess something like a nurse. And she's like, actually, I'm not an awesome super fucking scientist physicist. You know, just like the stupidest cheese ball cliche, ah, girl boss got you moment that you can have. And they have to put it in the first five minutes because of course you do. Cause that's our fucking stupid world right now. Lazy shit writing, but I digress. So they gender swap Wang Miao for Augie Salazar, another character named Luo Ji for Saul Durand, who is a uh, black man, another character, Cheng Xin, that has become Jin Cheng, so not much more there. Yun Tiang Ming, who is a uh, police, an older police officer, gets swapped for a young white guy named Will Downing. And Yang Dong gets swapped for Vera Yi, who I don't even know what Vera Yi is. Sounds like she's uh, Asian in her name, but to me, I don't know. Hard to describe. Whitey Asian? Uh, whitey, whitey Puerto Rican Asian? Something like that. Pointless DEI, swapping for the sake of swapping, rewriting characters, changing the way they're interacting in order to cater to the checkmark boxes that exist. Now, why is this so annoying? Well, because they're constantly doing it, but also because within the context of the fucking show and the book, you're highlighting the fact that groupthink is bad. The groupthink is wrong. So you've got the irony of a show at one point in time saying, look, communism, whoa, this is bad. These people are all buying into the same stupid ideology that's, that's really hurting their society, right? They're purging individuals in their society, because they don't go along with the group think here that we've all adopted, especially within the young. And then what are they doing? They're doing the same stupid group think bullshit, gender swapping, marking off the DEI checkboxes, rewriting characters, reassigning their roles, reassigning their, their races. And guess what? I guarantee you the people that put this show together were part of a purge to get rid of people that didn't buy into that group think. It's hard for me to think of a more ironic twist to have these two fucking things happening in the same show, but here we are. <laughs> uh, that being said, it's an entertaining show. And I think, as I said, it raises some pretty interesting questions. The books are fantastic. I would highly recommend reading the books, even if you're watching the show, kind of like Game of Thrones. I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of it. Uh, but yeah, man, damn, these people just don't, they don't get it. They don't see the hypocrisy. They don't see the hypocrisy with the group think. 
All right, that's going to wrap it up for this show, guys. Thank you so much for joining me here on Mean Age Daydream. Um, uh, by the way, we're getting a huge response from the uh, Brandon Joe Williams episode that we did, of course, about your secret tax doppelganger you've been conned into creating. Uh, I had to reschedule. He is coming back on the show soon. I had to reschedule, unfortunately, because I'm going to be at a trade show when I was supposed to talk to him for our next episode, which is in a couple of weeks. So I'm refiguring out that. And as soon as I get that set, we'll get that second one in there to show you how to break free of your citizenhood under the corporation that is the United States government and your corporate double ganger, which exists in Washington, D.C. So don't forget, you have a clone. It lives in Washington, D.C., and it pays taxes. <laughs> and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch that episode. Don't forget, guys, too, subscribe to us, please, on YouTube. Hit notify. We are still shadow banned. We will eternally be shadow banned. You need to hit that if you want to see the videos. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Rumble. And if you'd be so kind, if you want to get our bonus content or just like what we're doing, patreon.com forward slash lines of liberty, lines of liberty dot com, uh, <laughs> lions of liberty dot locals dot com. There you go. That's the other one. All right. That's it. From me, Brian McWilliams, from the Lions Liberty Network, and from Mean Age Daydream, keep those electric eyes on me, babe. Keep that ray gun to my head. Later. <laughs>